So, um, um, so I'm Ava Borchalazzo and I'm the co-director of her song, a uh, short animated film, co-director with Jack Irwin. And I am Vanessa and I am an associate of Her International. So um, as you're well aware, there should be a much more people here, but as it's you and I will we'll keep it as um, personal as, as, as possible. So your film, her song, um, I noticed at the end of it, you mentioned, um, you know, you gave a bit of Irish history in terms of the mother and baby homes. Um, where did the inspiration kind of come from? Is that where it came from or for the movie itself? Or Yeah, I think, um, I think originally it actually came from the band She, surprisingly, it was like kind of interested in her character and like her in with the Irish mythology. And we were then thinking of putting her in like today's setting. And like, there was this, con after the, the, the discovery of the babies in tomb and there's headlines everywhere. We were like, wow, she's mourning death and she kind of cries and someone dies and she must be crying constantly after, you know, that time and all these kids um, okay. like, would die and all this loss happened. It was like, she would have been all over the gaff crying everywhere. So we were like, this is interesting. The parallels between her and then these women going into these institutions and like how societies use women, the kind of crying hag and how the banshee is portrayed. And when we were researching her character, it was interesting because we found out that she actually isn't, like, before I would have thought she was kind of evil and like a harbinger of death and a bit scary, but actually she was like assigned to like five big Irish families um, as like kind of a protector and like more of like a warning to like warn the family that death is coming so prepare kind of thing and it was more helpful than it was evil so it's just interesting how that kind of narrative of her character was ch changed and then how these women who became pregnant outside of wedlock were viewed as evil um just yeah similarities so it kind of came from the banshee and then uh, once we kind of thought of it in the light of these mother and the mother baby homes, it was like, oh wow, okay, there's definitely a connection. So can... merging the history per se. Mm, yeah, exactly. Because I know that uh, growing up as well, the Banshee has always been like portrayed as an evil person, you know, person, mm. Halloween type of person. Yeah. But then when you actually, like you mentioned, when you did your research and you did your history, you're like, okay, this isn't true at all. Yeah. It seems. And even with the mother and baby homes, especially the one in, I think it's in Tsum, Galway, mm. um, like women are always portrayed as evil or wrong or sinful, that's the word, yeah. for having kids outside of wedlock. So it just kind of seems that, you know, the, the line, I don't know what to call it, but the line in between the two of them is that society portrays women in a negative manner if they don't um, fit into, to the structure that they built for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like, I wasn't going to make it political, but it seems very political. Yeah, I think it. I think it is in the way of just the the power of to kind of criticize the power the church had in Ireland for so long, and how like abused it kind of was in certain certain situations, and especially institutionally. Um. So I think it's kind of political. We are trying to kind of not be too well, we, we, we can't kind of be not too harsh on the church, but, you know, because what they did was awful. <laughs> but obviously there's good nuns and good members in there. Um, so, yeah, it kind of is political. I think it's commentary on the whole, um, that, that whole scandal, that whole, um, all that institute, like, yeah. All, yeah. Everything. I can't even summarize it, everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the movie itself, like, even from the first five seconds, I was like, this is very Irish. From the music to the animation as well, because I think that kind of animation is kind of I don't really see it in other countries, more so just Ireland. It's mm. more of an Irish like style of you know animation, basically. So um, in terms of like you mentioned before earlier that you know you and your director, like sorry, your co-director. Um, how do I put this now? So my question's gone out my head. <laughs> but um, yeah, you and your um, co-director that you, you decided on the topic, you decided how it was going to be done. 
um did you face any like um i won't say backlash but from people around you when you were bringing up the idea that this is what you want to do your film on yeah um i think like in terms of screen ireland and getting the funding they were actually like very open and supportive of the idea from the beginning like they did like the first script we submitted um they got us in touch with the script editor who really helped kind of narrow down the story and get it tighter but yeah no they were like very positive with it I think at the beginning when we were like telling people about the idea we had I think people were kind of like oh wow oh that's gonna be that's gonna be difficult to do and there's a bit more kind of worry from people of handling such a sensitive topic and through like rightfully so like it's very traumatic events that have happened and you don't want to kind of you know tell it and there's also the whole thing of coming up and whose story it is to tell and it's very personal for these women and the, these survivors are still living today so how would they appreciate it so we did like um go to a few other art gallery exhibitions that were around the subject and talk to a few survivors and kind of did as much as we could to see how it would be received by these women and then we we're constantly thinking of them while we were making it to make sure like is any of this you Not know yeah exactly so but generally like everyone that one that we got into actually making it and the funders and the, the other like talent of the, of the team were, were all very like encouraging and enthusiastic about it so which was great because it was kind of you know a bit of a nervous subject matter to go into no it definitely it definitely seems like it you know it's quite um how do i put it it's very important to get the message of course but at the same time, not step on anyone's feelings. And, you know, especially in this day and age of cancel culture, you don't want yeah. that as a, <laughs> as a filmmaker. No. <laughs> no, no. But yeah, um, my next question there for you is that, um, like while making a movie, you obviously learned a lot of, you know, information, things you didn't know before. What would you say was your biggest um, learning point? that or was your perspective on things did they change as you made the movie or did they kind of yeah like I think um we were listening to a lot it's justice for Magdalene was the um website we used and I had a lot of like interviews with um with, with the women survivors of these places and in my head I was always confused about the Magdalene laundries and the mother and baby homes and how like, what was the difference and similarities and so like understanding how that all worked was one thing and then also just the cruelty going on in some of them like I kind of thought it was just bad enough that they're separated from the kids and like that was it but there's also a lot of cruelty involved where like um in some of the homes they weren't given epidurals for giving birth so they gave birth without any pain medication and without a midwife in place and like just like a lot of it yeah and just like the blatant kind of like shame and just you know like with regard for women going through it and how little they were viewed in society and how nobody kind of just because of just what society was like at the time like you could do anything about it and then like I don't know kids being a, a kind of sold to American families and like sold on without the mothers knowing and just the level of it you're like oh my god yeah. this is crazy but I think I think you mentioned that part um towards the end of your video just before the credits rolled in that some of them were um, sold off or adopted without the mother's consent. Like, I didn't know that before. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, this is, I thought it was bad before, but now it's worse. Yeah, and I just like the details of it. And and then obviously there was like, there was lots of documentaries on YouTube and on different places we found. And there was some great nuns in there as well that did as much as they could. And lots of women would talk about, oh, there was a nun there who really helped me and was really kind. and. So then it was kind of the conflict of like painting all these nuns with this one big brush of evil, you know, where there was obviously some great ones in there working and helping, but unfortunately the majority, you know, how the, the church as an identity dealt with it was just abuse. So um, yeah, just like so hearing some of the stories was hard and quite eye-opening, but um, still great, like delighted to have got delved so deep into it. No, no, it's, um, I do like appreciate the film itself, you know, it's very educational. Um, I'm not sure about the banshee part, <laughs> if it's true or not, but educational nonetheless. Yes. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the movie overall, I definitely, definitely liked it. When I first started watching it, I was like, okay, this looks like a horror movie. And I don't do horror movies, but it turns out that it wasn't. It was just like 
displaying the dark aspects of um, Irish history. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of the actual, you know, making the film itself, um, do you have like the equipment or did you rent it out or how was that? How did that go about? Yeah, so we made it with a um, production company called Radio um, Animation, who were fantastic and very supportive. And they're actually the ones that kind of um, got us into to get this grant to make it. So um, the big thanks to Radio. Uh, but they supplied all the equipment and software. So we used Photoshop and Cintiqs, which are like big screens you can draw on straight on to for anyone who doesn't know. But um, yeah, so they gave us everything to work with. And we worked in a, in a little office on Baga Street in Dublin and made the whole film there. Perfect. And how long would you say the, the whole process took? Yeah, it's hard. Like, I think it was a seven month thing, like actual working and drawing, but then ideas and script writing was probably a few months to maybe the same again before, kind of different versions and come up with ideas and visual research and what's going to look like and design and all that. Um, but then once we like started the actual making of it, it was seven months of work, I think. Yeah, that's a long time. <laughs> It was a long time. Well, um, no, you I'm definitely made sure friends in Oh, are you hearing me? There I am. I hear you now. Sorry. Okay. I'm I'm you <laughs> so no, I said that you know seven months is. I don't know how long it takes to make a film. To be honest, but seven months and and counting, definitely a good job. Anyways, you and your yeah. your crew. Um. So in regards to, I think there was like two people that did the voiceovers. Yeah. Right. So did you just pick them or was there like auditions? Like talk me behind the process of the voiceovers. So we got um, Brenda Fricker and Nick Cochran's and we actually just got in contact with their agents and sent them the script and we got yeses from them kind of. We had to like just make it work around their schedule, which was grand. And we were delighted because Brenda Fricker, like the first woman to win an Academy Award in Ireland, was unreal to get work with her. And she was so much fun to work with, just fantastic. And then Nicola Cochran also was so great. And she's gotten so big. Like I think we got her just before Bridgerton and that whole thing exploded. Like she was telling us about, it. oh yeah, no, I'm working on a Netflix show called Bridgerton and me and Jack were like oh cool can't wait to see it and then all of a sudden it's like wait what this is what you were doing um and she had just come back to we had to get into Galway to record with her and she was back for like I think a few nights and it was the only time they could kind of capture and she was lovely like it was so lovely and she had like such few lines I think we made her say them so much like doing tiny differences and she was so patient I was like okay <laughs> so it was lovely and then yeah, Brenda was great as well. She was such a hoot um, and just so cool. Like I was reading lines with her and she was like, oh my God, you're Brenda Fricker. You read lines with me, it's mad. So uh, yeah, it was great. No, well, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, to me, it's like a big celebrity. So hopefully you'll be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, generally speaking now with regards to, um, I'm sure you've made other films as well. Um, so, yeah, just our grad film, um, which we made in final year of our co in college, and then we worked on, in radio, we worked on um, Aidan O'Sullivan's, his film called Nightlink, but her song is, was the first one we forgot funding for me and Jack to kind of direct. Okay, that's cool. And so, like, ultimately, as a filmmaker, what would be your, you know, your goal? Like, where do you see yourself? King, Sundance, Hollywood. All those. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously all those. It's hard to kind of uh, predict, but uh, her songs actually got a long listed for the Academy this year, 2022. Yeah, so yeah, so that's cool. So we're trying to get it to short list at the moment. So we'll see how that goes, which would, but um, and then we got we have funding to make another film, which is starting in November. So at the moment, I think it's just kind of whatever we can get to do, we'll do, and just try to keep making films as much as we can. And if we can't one day, we'll figure that out. You know, I think it's hard to predict it. <laughs> it's hard to predict, but at the end of the day, you know, consistency. So if you keep it up, mm. eventually, yeah. you just need that one opportunity. Then boom. <laughs> Thank you. So um, 
Let me see. So in regards to this film festival, like how did you hear about it? Um, I actually, how did I hear about it? I think I saw it on Film Freeway, but then a friend of mine, Alicia Slattery, uh, she does, the I think, blog sometimes for her international, and she was a friend of mine from school, so she actually asked if I did a, a, an interview of the film with her, which is very funny and good fun, so I did that, and then after I did that, I just applied straight away to this, because I was like, oh, this sounds great, um, a really cool festival, so yeah, I think it was maybe film freeway first but that definitely through Disha um, and her involvement with it that I kind of really took notice of it. Might have to give Alicia a shout later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well um what else? what else? What else? Sorry I'm kind of running out of questions. Oh that's okay. <laughs> that's good. Well um as a as a female um filmmaker would you say that the it would be harder or it is harder than say your male counterparts i i think in animate well see i don't know i think my experience in animation has been fine and i haven't met much kind of um like sexism or anything like that in uh, in the, what i've done but i haven't been in the bigger studio so i can't i don't want to speak for animation as a blanket term because there could be issues yeah. in areas that i don't know and I know in live action, there's definitely, I think, more apparent difficulties there. But so far, I haven't experienced much. And I hope that that <laughs> continues. But you never know. Um, Hopefully, you know. But it's Hopefully, great. You know. it's just, yeah. Because I know that, you know, generally speaking, in any industry, it's a bit harder for females to, yeah. to get up there or to get the recognition they deserve as, say, their male counterparts. Yeah, yeah. And I think... Yeah, I think I'm lucky because I work with Jack um, and there's so much mutual respect there and we're very like level there and we go in together for everything. So, so I think I've been lucky. I think you guys are like um, what's the word? partners. Yeah, exactly. And like, maybe it would have been I might have felt or noticed it more if I was going in by myself against and trying to get funding and doing it all solo. I think that, that might have been more of a challenge, but um. Yeah, and hopefully I, ha I don't notice anything, but I know that it is can be, can be quite like that. Perfect. So um, you said you studied filmmaking for about four years and then you started making your own freelancing, per se. So what kind of got you into filmmaking to begin with? Um, I think it was actually, I loved art in school, like art and drawing was my favourite, um, paired with English and stories and writing. So uh, animations kind of, to me, was a natural marriage of both of those subjects. Um, but I actually watched a documentary, I remember in transition year in fourth year, um, about DreamWorks animation and how that all started. And I was like, what? This is a job. This sounds unreal. So I think it was from then I was kind of like, class, this looks like kind of arty creation but also look like there's jobs at the end of it you know there's yeah. a bit of an infrastructure there an industry there so I was like okay cool I'll, I'll go for this um and yeah that was kind of what got me into animation and then in animation college I kind of wasn't that pulled to the actual animating skill set of it um, I found that quite hard and I didn't get much enjoyment out of it so it was in final year when we could actually make our own film that I really loved it I was like okay this is what I love so then I just kind of follow that then. Um, so it's a trust the process kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So like in the previous years prior to your final year, um, what kept you motivated really? Because I know some people would have been like, yeah, this isn't for me, drop out, choose another career. And what yeah. still keeps you motivated till today? I think, um, I actually don't know. Like I think in college it was, I think the class and the group were so great and it was very like, competitive and as like the standard was really high mm -hmm. so I think a part of me just didn't want to kind of fall behind or like I wanted to be as good as them and I found them all very inspiring in their skill level so I was like okay look I know I want to draw these guys are unreal at this so I'm just going to stay going at it um and then I also was with Jack my friend then as well so we were having good great crack as well and a lot of my friends are in the same college in IDT so it was really fun and then there was that kind of challenging aspect to it and um I was really interested in it as well I think I just found it I just found it quite hard but um yeah so I think it was just the challenge of it all and then very like surrounded by nice people and 
a good environment and all of that that kind of kept me going. Perfect. And um, what has been like your biggest challenge just from everything really? From, from say this particular film now, the first song. The biggest challenge. Um, I think like I find dialogue writing so hard like, I think we wrote the dialogue like 20 million times like it's just I find it impossible to write and make it sound natural and not cringy or cheesy or like but then they have to say really specific things to get yeah. the meaning across so dialogue I always find a headache um and then I think getting it done in the time that you have and staying within budget as well is quite challenging and you have to be very strict um with yourself and there could be great ideas for beautiful shots and sequences, but it's like animation wise, that'll take too long. It's not necessary. So kind of being cutthroat with like things you want to do, what's actually achievable. And um, yeah, that, I think those things may be the biggest challenge, like time management, budget management and dialogue writing. <laughs> but I know, um, I think when I was in third year in like secondary school, my religion teacher she made us all write like little dialogue between mm. us and like someone she just said write anything and some of the stuff people came up with when it was secondary school <laughs> um dad can I go to the shop yes can I get a balloon yes <laughs> so, yeah. Especially like thinking on your on the spot as well. Like you mentioned, you had to kind of make um you were restricted in your decision making, you kind of can't you know go out of your um let's say boundaries per se here. Mm. But um I would say a lot like just based on everything you've said, it seems that a lot of patience is required for for this job. Uh, yes. For this role. Yes, definitely. I think animation in general is like you, it just takes so much longer than you ever think it's going to take, you know, because you're drawing everything and then you might yeah. do it and realize, oh no, I did the layer on the wrong layer or something goes wrong and you're like, oh Jesus. So it is like even coloring in, like it's such a patience game. Like, thank God, Jack is way more patient than I am and he's way more niche than I am. So he's re- like much faster as so I get really slow and like going outside the lines. And then you're like, I'm even like coloring with pen and paper. <laughs> Yeah, like it's just it can be it's a real it does test your patience you kind of have to get into a zone of blocking everything out and just going for it without thinking about it because if you think about it too much you're like jesus i'm still coloring in this bloody character yeah and like i know it, you mentioned as well earlier that you know it's you kind of have to draw it scene by scene movement by movement mm. so i can't imagine doing that i draw a stick one and be like that's call it a day <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. and then I have to color. Do you have to color each like scene or each movement every time, or it's kind of um... pretty, pretty much like maybe depending on what is moving and not moving, you might be able to copy and paste a few of the frames or like yeah, hold one block of color. So you're so when you're designing the shots and everything, you you try to think in, economically. What's like like what can I get away with the most without it looking too still? You know yeah. or um but yeah normally yeah you would color everything frame by frame so it's like 12 I don't have that patience yeah I know and so it's like 24 frames a second you do 12 drawings per second and you hold it for a count of two so it's 12 per second so then it's like that by 60 is a minute and it just I don't know what like six minutes long five minutes long yeah I think it's six six yeah yeah whatever that math is I'm terrible at maths but it, yeah, it I know, is but that's that's a lot of coloring. That's a lot of coloring. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I'll just throw in one final question. Actually, two questions. So, um, what is, let me see, I don't know how I'm going to word this now, but as you've been in the, the business for a couple of years now, as I'd like to say it that way, um, what would be your advice to anyone that does want to go into filmmaking? Um, I think if you, I think it's just if you really want to do it, I think to do it and try not to give up or be deterred because I know it's quite hard, um, especially with getting funding and money and getting paid for it and all of those things. But I think it's kind of um, just you know, follow your dreams and ideas and keep going and then listen to other people and get feedback on it. And like I think 
ideas for stories and stuff when they come from you are great. And then a few people to help get that even stronger is always great. Um, and yeah, don't give up by, you know, no's from applications or no's from different things. Like I think just keep going because I do think it's like you make one film, you get a bit of reception from it and then it's like, you can keep going. So just make the first film, even if it's a shite film, just get it out of your system and get on the ladder and keep going, I think. And my question is gone again. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, here it is. Um, with regards to considering like you're an Irish filmmaker, what would you like? How do you see the Irish film industry growing, or do you see it growing like exponentially, or just step by step? Well, I think I don't know. I'm actually terrible for like live action film knowledge and Irish, the Irish industry, but in animation, it seems to be getting like so big. Like I think the guys in Kilkenny Cartoon Saloon, they I think like I remember reading was it last year that Kilkenny is like the hub of European animation now because of that that studio, which is incredible. Like all of Europe, these massive big, like France has such a rich and like long culture and history of film and animation and Ireland is still relatively young and new into it. So that's great. There's so many studios and like big studios that operate from Ireland and are Irish founded um, making stuff like Brown Bag, doing stuff for the likes of Disney Junior and really getting really big um, contracts and like shows and everything. So I think animation seems to be growing really fast and like exploding, which is great. It's really good to see. So my last question is turned into another question. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So um, if given the opportunity, would you stay in Ireland or if you were given the opportunity to say go to you know England or America where their film industry is massive, would you leave the Irish industry and, and go? I think I think I would um for learning purposes and just to experience like I'd love to you know live away from Ireland for a year or two, just you know, just to experience a different life and culture and all that stuff. Um, but I would definitely be coming back to the Irish industry. I think it's great. And I think um I, what's great about it is that it is because it's such a small country it is actually quite nice to see familiar faces pop up and it's like more easier to get to know people. Like I'd imagine this in the likes of the UK, it's so big and it's going to be harder maybe to kind of get chatting to people and get a bit of, you know, I don't know, make a bit of a dent in it or something. Um, but no, I would, I'd love to go and experience one of those um, industries like in the USA or in the uh, UK, just to experience it. Or Canada even also sounds cool, but yeah. Yeah, I think Canada is nicer out of the three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the people there are just generally nicer. But um what else? What else? What else? Yeah. It's I think I think I'll round it up there. Yeah, and, just, and just say that, you know, it's been it's been lovely talking to you. Your film was wonderful and all the best with the nomination or hopefully you get shortlisted and you know thank you. Thank hopefully you so win much. the award. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and lovely and to meet you and thanks for having me on. It's great to chat to you. You're very welcome. Now if Ollie would pop back on.